everyone. I am delighted to be the moderator for this panel, which I must say, having had a pre-chat with the speakers, it promises to engage us in rich dialogue. And the panel, as you know, the topic is exploring, documenting, and mapping black arts practices, spaces, and places. And um, I'd like to um, read out the context within which this was given to us uh, for us to talk about before I present the panel. And um, the context is art, community, creative interactions are often tied into the spaces where black bodies converge. Those spaces are not always performing arts venues. However, there are spaces where black lives are performed. As part of shaping Canada's culture, black creative histories in performance has rarely been documented. Our histories in the creative sector are often relegated to the one-offs. Yet, black creatives think and access the body subject and interact with space places differently. With demographic data and surveys indicating that Afro-Canadians interact with the arts differently, what are some of these untold stories? So I feel that the plenary is going to be uh, unpacking some of the ways in which black arts practices are documented, researched and preserved for future artists and creators. And so this session is gonna be uh, about insights from different people. But before the conversation, I want to appreciate Diane Roberts, who nicely set the tone of the day with her keynote. And I want to shout out some phrases, basically bits that stuck with me. Adapting to story, still they will rise. Migrating to learn more, to grow, leaving home, erasing home, our legacy, colonized bodies. We are leaving legacies, we gather, we deposit. When we carry our own weight, we carry our full potential, our bodies as archives, embodied archives, dialoguing with written archives, weaving a new kind of knowing, and lastly, reconstruct new identities. So make what you will of that. Now, back to, um, onto our panel, we have a great lineup on the panel and the speakers all bring stories of how the subject matter directly affects or indirectly shapes some experiences they have as individuals in the text. The format is gonna be that each speaker will present for 10 minutes and then we will have five to 10 minutes to ask one or two questions in between each speaker. And then I'll open it up to the participants before we go to the breakout rooms. But during the presentations, I will encourage you to please use the chat room as you have been doing to write any questions, observations or thoughts and reflections which we will pick up to help us move the conversation along. And um, after the speakers present, we will move into breakout rooms which we have already been into to expand on one or two provocations that will have sparked from the discussions, I hope. And that will be 30 minutes in the separate rooms and then we'll be back for uh, the next steps. So hopefully by the end of this session, we will have a tangible positive outcome that we or each one of us can progress or commit to around the subject matter of documenting black arts because we do need it. The panelists today, um, the first panelist is Emily Jibuin. Uh, sorry if I mentioned that. <laughs> I didn't mention it properly, Jabuin is a researcher, a contemporary and Haitian traditional dancer, and a producer completing her PhD in the Joint Ryerson York Communication and Culture Program. She, or they, is committed to expressing and producing stories for personal and collective healing by merging her arts and research practices. She runs her newly formed dance research and production company Emerge Products, Projects, which offers research, production, and artistic services to help creatives manifest their vision. Emily's working on many projects, including her own dance story 
and the co-production of a short science fiction film. So Emily's enriching her dance background in ballet, jazz, and contemporary by focusing on traditional Caribbean and Central African dance forms. A communication scholar with a background in political science and gender studies, Emily engages with the archives to share the history of black women's organizing, her findings on black life, health, and the arts in Canada. So welcome, Emily. You have 10 minutes to talk to us and then we'll ask you some questions. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, so indeed, I'm a researcher and a dancer and um, there's so much I wanna share with you. So I hope that I'll be able to uh, explain it in very concise form. So uh, my research is about mapping out black women's <clears throat> excuse me, Black women's organizing in Canada. And um, as a dancer, I'm also very interested in how Black women dancers have navigated uh, the jazz spaces in the eight, 1920s and 1940s. But I thought that today I would focus more on the 1890s to the 1900s. Now, um, one of the reasons why I thought that was really important is because as Robert Ball mentioned earlier today, there's a huge gap in Black Canadian history during that period of time. So there are a lot, many researchers who have done work in the 1850s um, who have talked about Black settlements, and then we sort of get rushed forward into the 1940s with Viola Desmond um, and more researchers doing a lot of work in that time moving forward, but then there's sort of a hundred year gap that's that's sort of missing. And so in the 1890s and early 1900s, there were definitely black people here in Canada. There were artists, um, uh, you know, the communities were thriving. Um, and some of the things that I want us to think about when thinking of mapping and documenting black arts practices is that there's certain things we sort of have to let go of. So one of those things is the idea of the legal legally recognized canadian u.s border that geography that colonial geography doesn't work for black people it doesn't work for acknowledging how we've been moving through spaces and through history because canada sometimes was not safe sometimes the u.s was unsafe after 1865 emancipation you know some black people in canada actually went to the northern u.s states um you know, during industrialization, that is mainly the 1890s to the early 1900s, you have a lot of Black Americans and West Indians who come into Canada to work on the railroads, who to work on the trains. Um, industrialization also means that you have a lot of industries popping up in Detroit, in Cleveland, um, Ohio. So you have Black Canadians also going to find work there because there was um, like there was socially and culturally practiced segregation in Canada um, well into the 1900s. So all of these dynamics mean that Black people are actually navigating a very different geography than, than we're um, meant to believe. And that means that, so I just wanted to share my screen um, shortly. So that means that when we're looking at um, geographically, this is really, I just tried to do my best to show you, you have, um, you know, um, black people in Toronto and Guelph, St. Catharines, Buffalo, Detroit, Windsor, Chatham, Cleveland, New York City. And so we have to actually start thinking about how were people moving in that space rather than how were people moving in Canada or in the US because then we're really missing a big part of the history. Um, so there's that. There's also the church. So there is so much, so much history, so much um, information and archives in the churches. And I'm not saying that we should limit ourselves to the church because there are some limitations in limiting ourselves there to find out about Black arts practices. But the church is really a place historically where Black artists have developed their art as musicians, as vocalists, as performers, and who have trained in a sense, who have even had employment opportunities. So, um, and this I, I thought was really amazing as I was finding all this information now is that vocalist groups, music groups are actually places where particularly Black women can be employed during this time. So there were many music and vocal groups that were mixed gendered. It was both men and women who were working in these groups, including the Jubilee 
the Jubilee singing uh, singers. And again, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so the Jubilee singers, um, there are Jubilee singers in Canada that were um, actually originally started by the Ball family. And um, there are also Jubilee singers that are may, maybe better known um, from Nashville, Tennessee, the Fisk Jubilee singers. And so these are vocalist groups who were singing spirituals and um, who have continued the legacy, the history of um, of you know the songs that were sung by enslaved people, and later on songs of hope, faith, uh, survival, resilience, and so um, back to this idea of geography, it's really important to to think of the fact that um, on this poster it says the Jubilee Vocal Organization of America. Now, it's just to say that. Black experiences and Black arts are interconnected in the US and in Canada, and also in the Caribbean. We, we have to sort of, if we want to really dig up our history and understand how complex we are as people and what our art practices um, really were and are still today, we need to understand that it integrates uh, beyond these um, arbitrary borders of Canada and the US. Um, so in this case, I'm actually showing you also uh, the blog page of a uh, um, humanity scholar, um, Jennifer Harris, who talks about a woman, Melissa Smith Hessen, who is an organist, a vocalist, and who is also a journalist, and who um, was who moved from Guelph to Hamilton to be able to take part as a Jubilee singer. They traveled across Ontario. Um, she also, the, the way that actually this scholar found out about Melissa Smith Hessen is that Melissa Smith um, published in the Detroit Plain Dealer. So again, back to this idea of geography. In the 1890s to 1900s, you don't have a lot of black newspapers, but you have some. But at the time when Melissa is publishing, she has to publish in Detroit to be able to, to be heard. So what that means is we have to now go to Detroit. We have to look at the archives in Detroit, in the US, in order to dig up the history of this woman who was living in Canada and who was an artist, who was a vocalist, who was a journalist, who was a writer. And even as I'm doing my research on um, Black women fiction writers in the Canadian Observer, that is a newspaper, uh, published by Joseph R. B. Whitney from 1914 to 1919 in Toronto, what I realized is that I don't know where these women were living. I don't know if they were quote unquote Canadian or American or even West Indian. It's just that they were publishing in this black newspaper because that's where they were allowed to be published. So again, thinking back to we, and even Joseph R. B. Whitney at, as, um, as the editor cross references or reuses um, newspaper clippings from American newspapers as well. So, um, and, and uh, yeah, so the black press, that's the last point. The black press is a huge, you know, has, has so much information in it, like rich, rich information about black history, about black artists. Um, the Canadian Observer was only being published for about five years, but on the very front page, page one, volume one, first issue, he, um, the editor has a, a whole column on the Ball family because it was actually the 50th wedding anniversary of Reverend and Mrs. R.A. Ball, who were ce celebrating 50 years of their wedding. And there were all their children, almost all their children there, hosts, friends, uh, you know, people numbering 400. And this event took place at the BME Church, the British Methodist Episcopal Church, 94 Chestnut Street in Toronto, so, um, or in Windsor. Um, and so there's just so much information. There's a whole paragraph uh, talking, like listing the names of the grandchildren, of the children, of where they were living, Hartford, Connecticut, Cleveland, Ohio, Windsor, Ontario. Um, and then you have a section where they start talking about, you know, the ball, uh, uh, Reverend Ball starts to sing and the audience just goes quiet. And it, it's just, they're remembering, they're saying they stole my children away, that old Jubilee Ballad. 
and then people mm. sing along and it's just you know and sometimes as I read that like I want to tear up because it's like I you know this is our history is here but it is not recorded in the way in which you know I guess vocal history, mainstream vocal history or mainstream dance is recorded. But we have to remember that that's because black, our black arts and black life are not separate. So, so we need to, we need to, you know, really go there. We need to dig up our history. We need to, to, to connect with the way that we recorded our own histories in the black press, wherever that may be. And remember like, and, and remember these things and collect them, make, make a point of doing that. Um, also in the black press, um, I was also to, able to dig up, you know, in Oakville, Ontario, there's a woman who was a poetess and a dramatic reader. So like the, the black press has a lot of information about all of these women, all of these people who were artists. Um, uh, you know, in Windsor, Mrs. Bowles was president of the Carnes Music Entertainers. So women were also in positions of leadership in the church, in the arts. Um, and so, so yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to talk too much longer, but just to remind us that um, sort of looking beyond geographies, beyond like traditional geography, um, thinking of ourselves as people who have always had arts as part of our, our lives, our practices. And um, yeah, and, and that also when looking at archives or information, looking for information, um, being very, very cautious too that, uh, for example, I've been to the Schomburg Center um, for research in black culture, and I've asked for um, Canadian content on the Jubilee Singers, and they've just told me, oh no, we have no Canadian content. Um, so then I just ignored that, and I went into miscellaneous folders, and then I found the information. So just keeping in mind that, um, you know, everybody's been told lies, everybody's been brainwashed into this idea that we are separate communities and that things work in this specific way, but that's how the mainstream works. Um, Toronto Star didn't start even talking about Black people people, um, you know, outside of criminality until the 1940s. And even when they started talking about Black artists in the Toronto Star, they were talking about Black American artists. Still, they just couldn't, couldn't manage to, to acknowledge Black Canadian artists. So all of those things um, contribute to the erasure, but there are definitely ways of finding out our history and mapping it in different ways. Wow. Thank you very much, Emily. And uh, you're getting a lot of wows, a lot of um, good vibes in the chat room. And so um, that's very exciting research that you've done here. And um, actually somebody said writer Whitney French also runs a couple of BIPOC writers circles and workshops and there's a link there. Yes. And then, uh, you know, having Robert Ball in the, uh, you know, on the yes. previous panel, that's another wow factor <laughs> moment. So it's really good. Um, so um, it's important, and somebody's saying here, sharing knowledge of familiar and community ancestors is important for us to fight against erasure. So that's really juicy information. Thank you, thank you so much. So I have a couple of questions for you, but um, um, I just want to also say that in the previous panel session, um, there has been lots of names mentioned. And I was very pleased to see that these are artists of our time, the ones that have been mentioned. And I have interacted with some of them. So just to say, we have work to do and more to document. Just bring saying that out first before we go into the questions. So Emily, we have another few minutes from, um, from your presentation. I can see that you have used your knowledge as an artist and as a researcher, because you combine both to be able to pull together a body of such important work to highlight this story for us. Now, thinking about the challenges you faced when extracting this key information for that period, maybe the 19, you know, 1890s and 1990s and 1920s, 1940s, what can you tell us about the state of play now? And then given the fact that art has always been a way of life for black people, and yet it's still invisible today? Yes, that's such an important question. Um, I consider that there's still the sense of segregation 
um, of uh, isolation and erasure of Black artists in Canada. And the previous panel has talked about that, about how, um, yeah, I mean, whether it's funding or just visibility, you know, I think if I wasn't in the Black art spaces in Toronto, would I know what all of these people are doing? Right. I don't think I would know just by, you know, paying attention to, I don't know, news outlets or advertisements or whichever. So, and that's why I think history is so important because when we understand history, we understand how things play out today and things are playing out in the same way in the sense that um, I would like to see, you know, um, it doesn't have to be a magazine, but just a way in which we continuously document and inform each other about our shows going on or what we need, um, you know, have this sort of collaborative platform that continues beyond um, this conference. And again, I want to thank Sapamo actually um, for this really, really amazing opportunity and space because I was very touched to be able to hear Robert Ball speak earlier and mm -hmm. to realize that, you know, I'm actually researching um, his, his family history. Like to me, it's just, it's very emotional also because I don't think um, we have all had the opportunity to do that. I'm so sorry. I wasn't expecting to respond that way, but it's just, um, so I'm of Haitian heritage. And when I think of my family and when I think of um, other families um, whose histories have been entirely erased, um, you know, it's very scary. But at the same time, I tell myself, but there are these records. There is the Black press. There, you know, there are ways. Um, and I also want to encourage people who have family archives to, um, you know, I, I try as a researcher as much as possible to create those connections so that people, we can trust each other and we can also uh, learn from each other and be able to to use that information that those archives that are so precious but that are so difficult to let go of of course when it's a family archives um and and you know whether it's robert ball or anyone else like i'm very interested in helping families work through their archives in order to to um like dig up some of that some of those histories um, I think that still, um, I mean, I can think of Dance Collection Dance, which is a, um, an archive for dance. Um, I think they're trying to do a, a, some work, you know, in documenting uh, dancers outside of uh, white dancers in Canada. I think that there's still, there still is, of course, a lot of work to be done around um, how we think about black dancers, how how black dancers, how black artists show up, because again, it's about our entire lives, right? Uh, Samson was saying that you know um, people have used their spirituality in order, like Haitians use their spirituality in order to gain independence, like like the arts, the singing, the songs, the rhythms, all of this is about our survival is about our life. So how do we then merge that into conversations of repertoire, of archives in a Western context? That's that's difficult, but I think if, if archives are willing to have those conversations, we can go somewhere. Or if, if archives are willing to just give us space, we'll figure it out. We just need <laughs> the space. We just need the resources, Indeed. right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I still think there's, there's a lot of invisibility. And I think we're still being undervalued in the mainstream. Now, if only we can, you know, serrer les coudes, like we would say in French, like, you know, stick together and then just work on what we need, um, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's so moving. Well, um, I've got somebody here saying, I studied history and would agree that it's very helpful to ask and document the stories of friends and family. And um, so well said, thank you for that. So um, I have one more question quickly because we, uh, before we go on to Paulina, uh, probably in a couple of minutes, just asking you, I know that you've touched on it, but what have you found that's very distinct on how our stories are documented 
all highlighted. I know that we're still invisible, but what is very distinct about what, what your research, uh, what you found? Right, well, I think um, for a last point, I would say that, you know, this idea that Canadian blackness is, um, it's not really, uh, like it's it's present, it's it's new. Like we just, somehow we have to really get rid of that idea because that is why me going into the Schomburg Center, um, you know, and having like black archivists tell me, no, we have nothing Canadian, like as though black Canada, like what, that's the new concept. Um, so, you know, that could break down those barriers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the fact that, yeah, we, uh, a lot of times, and this makes sense because this is a history that we know, we talk about Caribbean people as coming in the 19, you know, as early as the 1930s, but mainly in the 1950s and 60s and so on. West Indian people were coming into Canada as early as the 1890s, working on these railroads, you know. Um, so, so just maybe thinking of ourselves as um, always having been here in many different ways, even uh, in terms of indigeneity, you know, having been, being indigenous also to Canada, um, because there are generations and generations of, of black people, even previously to um, uh, people who have come through the Underground Railroad. And so, um, so yeah, I think that could really help us. Hmm. Um, hmm. Well, that's how distinct like that's the distinctiveness of our stories is like if we're just able to work through that yeah you know that's the sort of yeah distinct perspective that we're coming from and of course as you said give us the space and we'll do it uh i've got here uh also another wonderful comment uh saying i think understanding that everything we do and i think somebody mentioned it in the previous um panel as well everything that we do can be considered art is necessary to decolonize our thoughts about how to preserve our own histories. That's so cool. Yeah, and another one, sharing this knowledge with each other and with the next generation can help shift how we perceive our own history in Canada and our art in Canada. Thank you. And on that note. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emily. We will continue to ask questions um, after the third speaker. Um, but we'll go on to the next speaker. And um, I encourage you to continue writing questions and, uh, and observations in the chat so we can continue speaking and dialoguing. So it's kind of like free flow. The next person we have is Pauline, Paulina O'Keefe Anthony. She's an artist, educator, and a creative consultant who is passionate about helping people live their best lives through art making, wealth building, and lifestyle planning. She's also a mom of three kids and self-proclaimed travel junkie. She was born and raised in Toronto, but has a rich culture background, um, Polish mom and dad, Trinidadian. She found love for writing at age eight, and for performance at age 18 through spoken word, and then more recently playwriting. She also has been teaching creative writing and performance to groups of all ages since 19 years old. As a parent, she's been collecting life lessons to help other folks in balancing their career, parent life, balance including investing and making money on the stock market. She has given a TEDx talk and she gets to work with hundreds of amazing artists. So Paulina, speaking like a spoken word artist, I hope we have invoked enough energy for you to give it back in your presentation. Welcome. Thank you. And I'm very excited uh, to be here. Thank you Sissy Pomo for inviting me, um, especially for this particular panel, which I think was such an interesting uh, topic to even start looking at and didn't realize until I really got into conversation with Mercy and uh, Emily over the weekend how deeply connected it is to my arts practice. So for those who uh, don't know me, uh, I am a spoken word artist and uh, more recently transitioning ha have transitioned to playwriting. Um, and I, I just want to say that I feel like my work has been always been steeped, but I've just like really noticed it now in reclaiming non-traditional performance spaces 
um, or spaces for performance and audience engagement, uh, whether that be through spoken word, guerrilla poetry, just street poetry and learning. And that's how I came into my arts practice uh, to more recent works with uh, the playwriting that I'm focused on in the connections of carnival history to contemporary Canadian celebrations of resistance through carnival culture or caravana. Um, so I wanted to uh, approach this topic today uh, and just connect the two parts to it. So first I'm gonna talk about black creative art spaces. And then the second, uh, how our art is researched and preserved, because I think for me personally, as an artist, that is a very important, um, a very important fact in terms of uh, combating the erasure that was mentioned earlier. So I just wanna say through my work, uh, I've learned that when it comes to black art in particular, our black art forms taking the stage because I'm a performance poet, uh, playwriting actor on, on stage. Uh, what I've noticed is that, that looks very different um, from what is considered professional theater sometimes. And our art forms are always, uh, I find outside of the box. We're very innovative and creative um, all through the historic need to actually innovate around the barriers that have been consistently put before us in participating in traditional, what would have been traditional theater, theater spaces. And so it is in this innovation and ingenuity that we have actually reclaimed spaces um, and recurated them in ways that I think are very specific and special to our black arts and culture history. Um, you know, my particular background being from, uh, on my dad's side from Trinidad and, and learning very much about the power of like street performance through carnival um, and not just as entertainment, but education as protest, as resistance, as so many things. It's not just, hey, come to this show, enjoy it and forget about it. You don't forget about these things because you are immersed in them. You are not watching passively, you are actively engaged in them, whether that be spoken word and you know snapping. And if you've ever been to a spoken word slam or poetry show, you know, as an audience member, you're not sitting there golf clapping at the end of a performance, you are in it, you are, uh, you were hearing our whoops and our calls and our deep belly kind of gruntle, uh, whatever responses that our body naturally produces. And the same thing when you, if you've ever been to Carnival, which is the other aspect that I'm researching in my play, is it is extremely immersive. You it, to the point where you even lose yourself as an audience member and become part of the performance. So mm -hmm. these things I think make uh, our the way that we present theater in in if you want to use that word in performance in a very special way in a, in a way that um, moves it away from just presenting to actually building with community and culture. So that's that was very interesting to me in finding that uh, as I was going through my own uh, arts practice. And I think, again, Black art forms are, spe are specifically, um, sorry, Black art forms specifically in performance theater, I feel are very much about bringing art to the people as opposed to asking the people to come to it. We We don't sit, we don't wait, we are bringing it to the people. And again, I think that again is steeped in a deeper need um, for whatever we're presenting. It's not just to present, there is a meaning or a purpose behind it. And that's why there's an urgency. And therefore we don't allow the barriers of not being able to book theater space for however long um, or grand theater space. We just find ways to make sure that the message is being brought to the people. Um, whether that be for education, celebration, audience interaction versus just audience performing, uh, viewing the performance. And it's often, I think, a key ingredient when we are thinking or curating or building our presentations in the first place. I think for myself, I, I can speak for myself particularly, right away I am always thinking about the audience. Who am I writing for? Um, how am I writing it? How is it gonna sound? And how, very specifically, how is the audience integrated in what I'm doing? Right? How am I making sure that they are engaged, that they are not just sitting there and taking in, but they are deeply actively part of the performances that I'm putting together in my arts practice. And I think that very much stems from my traditional cultural history, particularly in carnival and street theater and, and understanding that that is a very key and integral part of the process in creating that you are actually already preemptively thinking about your audience as part of your production, not, not in a latter way as, 
okay, now we have to think about outreach and development. You know, your audience was already there at the beginning of the inception of the creation. So for me, that's very important. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin's killing me. Um, so again, there's there's always deeper meaning to these performances, and and again, one thing I I also learned in in my arts practice is that besides just um, the element of performing, that oftentimes when we are putting together these performances, that they are steeped in more than just just art. Somebody was saying, you know, our very beings and our very existence is art. It is because a lot of these performances are steeped in ritual. They're steeped in traditional practices. Um, they are uh, steeped in pre preservation, actually. So it's actually essential that these things come out because this is part of, and as we segue into the piece that I'm talking about, about research and preservation, nobody is documenting this for us. So we actually have to be very intentional about the way that we perform in practice. So we are self-documenting and then passing on those uh, essential traditions, uh, spirituality, ritual, whatever it is, and to make sure that that continues to be preserved in a particular way. And I think that is essential in connecting us to our spirituality, our ancestry, and our stories, because those things are stolen from us often or lost in migration, which is often forced either through slavery or through being pushed out um, due to economic, uh, socioeconomic, political, socioeconomic, political reasons. Um, and, and you see mass migration to Canada or the US for those particular reasons. And so again, these things I think um, have to be preserved and self-documented so that we actually do not lose ourselves um, in that migration and that we are bringing those things consciously and intentionally to wherever the new places that we end up being rooted in. So that is the first part in terms of like looking at how we see black spaces um, and how we create in those spaces, how we reclaim those spaces. And even though now we are being opened up to spaces of traditional theater spaces and that's great and I love the stage it's so great but again when you go back to those spaces that we actually had in the first place and 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 what we had to work with it brings that connectivity to everything that is part of our ancestry and culture and actually I think it's better in engaging um and and yeah, engaging the audience, I think, deeply into your presentations, right? I, I love being in theater and on stage, but it's completely different than when I'm when I get to be in a space where I can actually walk through my crowd and I'm doing my poetry and I'm here and I'm pulling you and I'm thinking and I'm seeing you and I'm making deep eye contact and I have that maneuverability versus you just watching me on this platform and we're not as connected. So I can feel the differences in those traditional spaces versus the spaces that we have actually made our own traditional spaces, right? So that's just my piece on, on space. And then from there, we could definitely segue into talking about researching and preservation because we, again, are, through our art forms are not documented research and preserved as Emily was saying in the in the traditional ways or in the grand ways of doing so and so for me what's important around research and preservation first and foremost all of my work is founded in mentorship and relationship building because that's what we have whether that be with our peers but more 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 likely with our elders and our ancestors before they depart from this world and even those who have departed and have left very uh, strong legacies to for us to continue to build off of uh, our own foundations, right? So preservation is most often found in the passing down of arts practices in people, in, in, in person through oral storytelling or a dedication to learning from an elder, right? You want to bring that respect, especially if you are later on going to contemporize that piece, you have to know the foundations, the roots from which, from which you are going to make those changes and, and create and curate your own, your own style of that. Right. This is essential, I think, to how these art forms um, have survived through migration, destruction, attempts of assimilation, spirit, breaking of spirit even. Right. So in order to uh, destroy our cultural art forms in the way that, you know, colonization has wanted to do so in past, it's literally down to a spiritual breaking because we are so strong in that. Um, and that you can see the essence of our art is actually coming from the essence of our spirit. So in order to actually destroy our culture and art, you would have to destroy the spirituality of a people, which as we know, black people are lit and it was very, very hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I think our art forms are not documented in the same way as traditional art forms because they are created of, of resilience and resistance. And oftentimes that leads to, to, to practicing them or performing them or preserving them in secrecy 
right? And so we have to keep these things for ourselves. Otherwise they are stolen from us or destroyed or, you know, in modern day appropriated and then resold, repackaged to us as if, and, and we're paying a high premium price for things our ancestors were giving us for free, which is nonsense. So our art forms were outlawed many times over. And so preservation, I think the act of preservation itself has become sacred. Um, and I take it very seriously when I'm working with my elders. Um, the importance of document, documenting, uh, doc documentation of the old practices and stories by new generation artists like myself, like Emily, like many of us who are here, um, especially in preserving those stories in the diaspora, which is also just like another level in itself, is critical because globalization has really opened the borders and we migrate to other parts of the world. So if these traditional practices are not properly carried over, we lose the important pieces along the way of our history and the foundation, which is important again to know, even in creating works which may contemporize these pieces, you have to know the foundation from which you are recreating or knowing Otherwise, you find gener new generation artists who think they've stumbled upon something great and new and innovative when, when everything is just repeated, when everything is from ancestor and tradition. And you have to, if you don't know how to connect back to that, then you think you've created something that's actually already been out in the world in a different space and time. Um, often I find our performances are tokenized, pushed into the box of community arts, which I actually hate, uh, which is undervalued, uh, underappreciated, and suggests for some reason a lack of professionalism when we are actually very deeply professional and probably more strategic, um, sacred, and serious about the way that we practice and build our art forms. Um, and you can, uh, I personally find that this is evident in the way in which historically this categorization of community arts has justified a lack of arts funding for our art forms. Examples being, you know, lack of funding for carnival arts or spoken word poetry historically. Now we are seeing an increase in that, but historically spoken word poetry was not considered like a mainstream art form. And so getting funding for that was very difficult. Our art forms have generally been pushed into a cultural box as opposed to a focus on the art forms themselves thus denying that there is an inherent professionalism in our practices, even though our community's culture has influenced arts practices worldwide and failed to get the appropriate recognition for that on a regular basis, monetary and other. And then finally, I'll just close by saying, I think our, our Black art forms are fighting to be recognized and legitimated every day, all the time. And our creative leaders are fighting to be accepted into spaces where they are rightfully belonging, uh, belonging and based on the merit of their work and their expertise, which is why this, this uh, three-day gathering is incredibly important, right? Example, uh, other examples like the barriers presented to spoken word artists such as Lillian Allen and Dwayne Morgan um, being, uh, you know, denied entry into the League of Poets historically and having to fight to go in there and having to fight to see the different, uh, to see that there's no difference between spoken word and poetry, but that that was an othering so that they could be denied access, which is wrong, right? Or a lack of adequate funding for Caravana or, you know, Scotia Bank Carnival or whatever you want to call it, it's Caravana for Life, okay? Which is a huge economic driver for the city. And yet, if you see the reci reciprocity in the funding for that particular cultural event, nothing it's very limited right and, and and what we're getting back to produce this thing that has put actually toronto on the map in the in the diaspora the caribbean diaspora and beyond so j those are just some examples so i think we will have to continue to fight uh to be recognized and legitimated and and work within the funding structures work within the professional spaces and as much as we want to you know continue to use uh the art spaces that we've cultivated in street theater and and other places we still should be fighting and knocking down the door to be also recognized recognize as professionals in professional spaces and be treated as such and have the option as to which spaces, just like anybody else, that we can practice our art because it is no less um, valuable than any other arts form. In fact, if you look again at the global impact, it's probably the most valuable um, uh, art forms that are influential in, in, in all kinds of uh, sectors of art. So yeah. that's where my work has taken me. <laughs> wow, definitely. You've given us the energy back and it's, <laughs> thank you so much, Paulina. <laughs> Um, I really what comes to mind pulling from the keynotes um, or oh, um, I'm thinking about embodied archive versus written archive and uh, some of the things that you actually said here are the act of preservation has become sacred 
that's one. And then if we, you know, with this globalization, if we're not careful, we'll lose the pieces along the way. So we have to know the fundamentals we are creating as artists. So the fundamentals of creating art uh, or knowing it is important as well. So thank you so much. Um, the chats are full of applauses. And so I'm gonna read a few of them to kind of get us uh, moving before we bring in the third person or the questions that I need to ask you actually. Um, outreach and community at the moment of inception, it's so important. Um, for deeper meaning and creation and presentation, uh, um, that's good. Preservations, yes. Art as history, art as archival preservation. And um, international performance and practice, come, <laughs> come one now, church. Robert Ball, prepare to sing. Emily, prepare to dance. <laughs> So, and uh, I think uh, it's really, it was really, so somebody was saying, I didn't know I was coming to church when I logged in. So, you know, this is amazing. <laughs> so thank you so, so much. Now I'm going to have to pause um, and there's loads more. So feel free to go into the chat and read through everybody. I encourage you to add more uh, because this is so exciting, uh, but we have to move on. Uh, anyway, um, I have a couple of questions for you. From your presentation, I think that understanding your process is key to how you navigate the various platforms, places and spaces that pre present the Black Arts form that you do. So I'm just thinking, how should we try and educate the powers that be to think outside the box? And as an artist, how are you trying to do that within your art? Yeah, so I, I would say in terms of the powers that be, first and foremost, I'm an absolute advocate in the funding world for more funding and, and more concrete, long-term, um, deep funding for Black arts across the board. So I will continue to raise my voice at all three levels of arts councils and ensuring that uh, they are providing adequate support. But that's just the funding realm. So we still have the spaces, we still have, you know, uh, other areas. I would say that at this point in time, I just continue to produce my art at, at a, what I feel is a professional level, high quality in my performances. I feel like my poetry tells stories that need to be told and I make it a practice in particular to do so in front of audiences that need to hear it. Um, I, I would say I used to be very afraid in the, my early career um, and found myself muting my, using my art and but muting it in a particular way um, to be kind of politically correct or I didn't want to offend anybody but as I continued about halfway through my career as I continued and changed and when I saw that the world could not afford for that to be muted that completely went out the window I am not afraid to say anything in any space that I think is truth and truth telling um, I also find opportunities often in my art to actually speak about these things but like weave it in through an artistic form so uh, I use my art to archive other artists uh, it themselves, whether through my poetry, if you've ever looked at my poem, Hutacha, I'm really, really uh, passionate right now about speaking uh, and highlighting black um, black women uh, poets from Canada because they have, there's very little recognition. There's very little history about that. Even like down to my, I'll just put my screen down, down to my t-shirt. My t-shirt line here is, is all about uh, just being a walking billboard. <laughs> <laughs> for black artists who came before me and, and set that path right and I, I had a comment from a, a young lady who who uh, received my t-shirt as a prize in another um, in another event and she says you know every time I wear this t-shirt somebody asks me about who those people are and then I have to stop and have a conversation and there you go this is the <laughs> preservation and documentation and education of black history you can do that walking down the street right um, and I, I would say my process in the play particularly that I'm working on is based in in very much in um it stems very much from documentation and preservation i see myself as the next generation that feels compelled to reach out to my elders and take those stories um, and arts practices and document it through my own practices and what i'm putting out on stage I, I, and taking uh, that research piece very very seriously um and acknowledging and honoring while i'm doing that so i'm uh last year you know i think bushra janaid might still be in here but shout out to the oac for um that professional development grant which allowed me to go back home to trinidad and be reminded right there in person that street theater is legitimate theater by speaking to those who i considered elders ancestors and the masters of that craft and that we don't create 
um, that, that we don't create with what we and our ingenuity and resilience, we, we are, folks are bringing, bringing us scraps and we're creating elaborate performances and, and, and pieces that they wish they could create with all the money that they do have that is globally influencing everybody. And to be back home, to be reminded of our greatness in being able to do that is very key in the process when I am building. So speaking back and forth with elders, um, reaching back into my ancestry and those, you know, those who run through my, my brain, uh, sorry, through my blood, yes, definitely Sankofa is important is an important piece of my process because I never wanna feel like something I created is the first of its kind because it never will be. It's always coming back. Uh, it's always a coming back of what has been there, but now we are making it contemporary for our time. So we have to keep, um, continue to ensure that our art forms are being do documented and preserved and next generation art makers should feel compelled to learn the foundation, as I already said, about their traditional practices to understand their own work and what they're going to now contribute to what has already been laid down in foundation, I would say. Ah, thank you. Um, wow. Okay, uh, now we have, a, a, I think I'll read one more. I love this and the international arts community needs to hear this. Whenever I see biennials in East Asia, it reminds me of just how far Eurocentric art discourse has reached. Will any of these recordings be translated in various languages? That's one for us to think about. Um, so um, the last question that I have for you before I bring in um, the third speaker is, um, how do you appreciate or embrace or even influence? So we need, um, I think you, you just have to take a couple minutes for this one because we're yeah. gonna run out of time. So how do you appreciate, embrace or even influence the relationship between audience and performer, writer and reader, etc., to contribute to your work and hence your story? Yeah, so I think for that one, uh, I would easily say that the audience um, is part of the performance first and foremost. So like I said, I keep them up front in my mind so that they are there and part of the performance, which makes it easier to incorporate, to think, to create around, to around that and engage them in, in those pieces, whether it's playwriting, whether it's spoken word. And so I think if we keep the audience at the forefront um, as, and thinking of them as community, yeah. definitely patrons, but more, more so community, how do we want to, I'm thinking, how do I want to bring them into my fold? What do I want to do with them? And how do I want to actively, you know, engage and activate them within my own performance? And I write that right in and I direct that right in. And even the, the idea of space, what is the space I'm using? All of those things come into play when I'm, when I'm creating um, any of my works. So. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, that's amazing. Thank you. Uh, um, I hope we can continue to have that conversation and pick some of the stuff that you did say in the breakout rooms. Uh, but um, yeah, it's, uh, I think that's very rich and there's definitely um, you know, engagement in the, uh, you know, according to the chat room, I think people are ready to discuss more. So um, we now have Michelle, I think she's around. I think I saw her. Yay, we have Michelle. <laughs> so um, I'll introduce Michelle and then she will have 10 minutes to speak and then we can have questions as well um, for her. Right, Michelle Moss is a dancer, choreographer, researcher, and community educator. She considers herself a citizen of the world, born in the UK of Jamaican and British parents, raised in Liverpool, London, and Montreal, resident of Calgary for the last 40 years. She's currently associate producer and is serving as chair of the dance in the School of Creative and Performing Arts at the University of Calgary in Calgary, Alberta. She greatly enjoys high U Calgary teaching research as well as civic and national choreographic commissions, international teaching and the many opportunities to conduct ethnographic research in the field, namely in New York City and West Africa. Her teaching focuses in jazz, uh, her teaching focus is jazz, is jazz dance technique from authentic to Afrofuturism, global dance practices and pedagogy. Her research mostly takes the form of creation projects, but also includes numerous writing projects, 
articles and book chapters that move from page to stage and back again. In the middle of the current pandemic, the next projects include a dive-in dance spectacle with DJD that is decidedly Jazz Dance Works, I think it's uh, established in 1984. It's a concert jazz dance company she co-founded. So over to you, Michelle, and welcome. Why, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I wanted to start with thanking you, Mercy. Thank you for having uh, patience with me. And Kevin, thank you so much for the invitation. I have to ground myself because I've been on Zoom already for many hours. <laughs> <laughs> Meetings and teaching at the University of Calgary, we carry on mostly in person, but um, also online. There's nothing unique that I have to say. What beautiful presentations from those young women. Um, I have been researching for a while and trying to find ways to communicate my research to interested parties, to arts organizations and, and practitioners, as well as students. And I feel a little breathless right now and a little, well, very excited to express and communicate with you not a lot is unique though. Um, my mapping over the course of my career, my professional career and my time in the professorial as, um, as a professor, I did start moving up from an artist to the university and finding that new path and that accreditation and having to move my research into different methods methodologies was very exciting to me and you know what the truth is I have always been very mm, how shall I say it my method is zigzagging is switchbacks <laughs> is recursive always returning to identity and representation and the body and embodiment but the roots the practices they do come from the culture that I was born in. And I just have to say, I've been so inspired by social dancing and by the dancing that I, I started dancing in England very young. I took tap dance, I took ballet, I kept dancing. And this idea of practicing and so living the research is becoming more and more important to me. You can see the hair is turning gray. It's not just a function of COVID. I had already started down this path because I wanna keep dancing. The root practices that inspire my work in jazz especially and in education and passing it on and encouraging people to take those experiences and take the root of their culture or the contemporary expressions, knit it with the lived experiences and express yourself. I am so enjoying this um, career, this profession that has allowed me such diversity I love creating dances. So yes, I am working with Decidedly Jazz right now on a drive-in dance. Just like the olden days, get to, to you know connect to the FM channel in your car and receive a soundtrack and see images in front of you and keep the dancer safe during these COVID days. But the idea of that space of decidedly jazz's incredible dance palace, as we call it, or jazz dance palace, because it's an incredible place and space and many people had a part in it. I'm just so glad that I was one of the co-founders. We worked really hard in those early days but that palace lives and exists and it's for community. 
to come in and use that. And I always, because it was part of, hmm, how shall I describe my father's repetitious teaching ways, the Caribbean teaching, repeat, repeat around the table, tell the stories again and again, as many mm. people do. But he always reminded me that, yeah, we are building something and you stand on the shoulders of many. So even though that action was taken to create that company and to, uh, you know, bring it into existence to birth it, there were many, many people that assisted with that. Hmm. The other thing my father used to always say is the citizen of the world, you're a citizen of the world. So I am of uh, mixed heritage. I am biracial. And these things are important to me. They do. They register in the way that I am. My father, through, you know, the migrations that happened in the world for economics did find himself in England and did make a life there. And he was a citizen of England, but he never forgot anything that his grandmother taught him. And the references, for his, it was mostly his grandmother that brought him up, it are the lessons that he told me and I wish that I would have written more of his stories down. So this idea that um, stories capture your imagination. So I heard about a person and her name was Germaine Aconier. Ah. It was in the early days and she had a collaborator and um, someone she created a, a, a a collaboration with, uh, oh, his name has just gone from my mind. So we'll have to just, oh, uh, Maurice Beja. And I was fascinated by this idea of Mudra Frick. And I loved to imagine um, the, I didn't even know really what African dance was. I made a solo in collaboration with um, my longtime mentor. I didn't know what it meant. But I, it felt right, it felt interesting, it felt beautiful, it felt regal, it felt sacred, it felt powerful. And the impressions that I received from this solo just spurred me on more. So in 1986, we went to Africa. Hey, I found Germaine's apartment or her house. Her name was on the gate but she wasn't home. She was surely in Europe. But then all these years later, two years ago, through Mercy and the work of Vivine Scarlett, I met Alessandra Soutin, who lives in London part-time, is of um, Belgian heritage, I believe. I hope I didn't make yeah. that. Yeah, yes. good. Yeah. And uh, I found my way to École des Sables. And Germaine, again, was not home. But one day I'll meet her. But this <laughs> idea of knitting and mixing what I call roots jazz. So when I watched in West Africa and enjoyed and took into my body, the dances, I recognized jazz. And so this social dance, street dance, this powerful, we did take it to the stage and I take it off the stage and bring it to the community. So for example, we are in Calgary. Um, the weather was just very, very beautiful, but it changes in a moment. And so the, the 16 degrees can turn to 40 below, 30 below, and I am not exaggerating for effect. I am talking Celsius. But we are gonna do, beside the drive-in, I'm gonna do something during this festival we have called Chinook Blast, where I hope we get a Chinook, which is when the thermometer moves above uh, zero and we get nice weather, but we might not. But we're gonna take it to the street again. 
and we're going to share and we're going to teach. Even during COVID, it has some parameters around it so that it's safe. But these practices are alive in the community. And the reason that I think I am driven to this is because it's woven into my DNA. So this um, mentoring and educating um, and creating dances that are expressive of who I am, where I come from, and hopefully connect to people. So I've had the good fortune to work with many beautiful scholars over time. And of course, I'm always driven to that. In the early days, I didn't understand how important it was. And recently I had through um, a beautiful person and a, a colleague and researcher, she's at U of T, I just have to have a sip. Too much talking this morning already. <laughs> um, Seika Boy um, at the U of T just had a program called It's About Time. And it she, wo she, she drew me into the project by reflecting on my history that was so vital to me. I didn't know it at the time, but it was so beautiful. When I moved from London to Montreal and was gathered in by my Jamaican family and we got to celebrate and have so many family and friends parties and dancing and I got to go to a very special and particular school called the NCC, and it stood for the Negro Community Center. It was a very powerful place. Wow. Um, and some of the, the women that were there teaching dance and music and theater, and you put on concerts, they were from across the border. They were from America. So this is, um, you know, this, this revealing of all this is not just um, my biography or to tell you where I studied and what I did, but this was so vital to understanding who I was and meeting my cousins because in England, I did not have that many people of color to interact with. And it was unfortunate, but then went on to meet so many beautiful people, dance teachers and scholars and, you know, absorbing and understanding the work of Catherine Dunham and studying oh. with Milton Myers and um, finding some lifelong uh, collaborators and colleagues, Ava Lavon Vinicet, who's at Duke University. And of course, my specific tribe that I found in Calgary. So although I am a citizen of the world and although I am very deeply committed to ethnography, field schools and ethnography at home and mm -hmm. autoethnography, these things um, are all kind of part of who I am. I mean, growing up in Montreal, besides the Negro Community Center, one of the first companies that I saw was Les Ballet Jazz, and there were people of color in it those days, and it was when their work was more social dance rooted and brought to the stage, and that was interesting to me. Then the likes of La 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 Human Steps, Louise Le Cavalier, who I've gone on to meet and totally respect her and her art practice. But I wish I, I wish I was a researcher at that time so that I could say, ah, oh, this acrobatic tradition, you know, the Fula people, there is some evidence of this. Mm -hmm. the, the rise in Toronto of reggae and dance hall. Um, of course, it called to me and I saw Bob Marley in the concert hall in Montreal. I listened to the Mighty Sparrow at all the <laughs> dance parties and I understood 
through a really embodied experience, what it was to liberate the pelvis and yes. how this tradition was so different from yes. what I was interested in and was moving towards. So in the early days of DJD, we also had a show like Seika that was called It's About Time. And it was revealing the jazz tradition and the roots of jazz, music and movement. And I love swing dancing and I loved more than anything else dancing with Frankie Manning. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so those legacies, those roots, that yeah. call for um, those, you know, ideas and I'm just looking at the clock. So yes, um, we, we've got, um, yes. <laughs> um, in I have a couple of questions anyway, which I have to ask. Yes, anyway, of so. course. So yes. I'll just be really quick to say, you know, I really, um, I have to say thank you to my family, to my mother and father, both lovers of music and dance. And in England, my father back in the day had a social dance club one that had no alcohol. It was an all ages club for people to come together, change their landscape, change their experience through a simple act of dancing together in community, in relation to each other. Wow. And then taking that and moving it into education. Why should we care? That's what I named my research um, paper in my master's thesis was why dance <laughs> why dance I'll leave it there you guys can all answer that I know oh what a great history it's so great to hear from you Michelle and uh just the way you said it in terms of the mixing and the knitting of the history what you're calling roots jazz and also the liberation of the pelvis, you know, loads of people are saying yes, yes, yes to all of that. And actually somebody said, it's so great to hear your history as it's like mine. So they're identifying, it's energizing and encouraging to share proud stories of our histories, especially in spaces where they are safe and embraced and yes. feeling through movement, what feels right, yes? And I've got somebody else. Yes, yes, yes. Connection again across the African diaspora as a part of the documenting, mapping and creative practice. So thank you for all of that. Now, I have a question for you before we continue. And uh, obviously from your presentation, your career places you across education and performance. And given the length of time you've been in these fields, no doubt you have picked up nuances of where black arts is taught learned and preserved or not. So what are some of your sentiments on how this has or is progressing? And then I'll also kind of bring in this idea of decolonizing the curriculum. Yeah. Can you say something about that in a few minutes, please? Yes, I can. I can be brief. <laughs> I can be required. I can't, I'm lying. But um, so, First of all, over time, and as I moved into the academy, I have had many guides um, from the likes of authors who put their ideas on the page and to people I have come into contact with. Um, most, you know, in the last 15, 20 years, the likes of Tommy DeFranz, who kind of, you know, requires us to lift our research game. But the, what there is, there are many people um, and some of them are white collaborators who encouraged me from the earliest time when I felt like, you know, I'm on an, uh, a, uh, what do we call it? A granting uh, panel, peer panel and I am speaking for a certain person of color who has presented their grant. And they would say, more, tell us more. What mm. do you see that's valuable in here? So there is, there is a lot of people advocating and trying to move things forward to be succinct 
I will tell you what my agenda is. More action, less talk. Yes. So we're indeed. at this place. And I've been here so many times serving on committees of plurality at the university where I serve, on national boards, talking about equity, talking about diversity, talking about inclusion, teaching in the schools when I did my practicum, going out there to do the research by working with those individual students, teaching them something special, something about jazz and its West African roots. And to this day, I am still dazzled that students just minutes ago mm. are still telling me, I have studied jazz for 10 years. I have a foundation in it. I had no idea what its roots were and what the musical canon is that is associated. So something it, that we're doing is, is not on. Walking. We got to lift our game. And I wonder if the decolonization sometimes, uh, it's not that old that we've been, or long that we've been saying it, but it, I don't want it to become rhetoric period. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Michelle. That has been so rich and that's been so wonderful. So I'm going to actually share <laughs> something that um, when we spoke, um, uh, but, but the, you know, when, we, when you and I spoke to prepare for this presentation, you painted a marvelous picture for me and I didn't forget it. And you said something along the lines, Ronald K. Brown, Put him with the ocean, the heat, and a topic on dance. Yeah. Hmm. I think what That's you achieved, <laughs> I think your story as well is really rich, equally magical, perhaps in different worlds to this, to his. But yes, you have an amazing story. So thank you so much. Now, well, the, I just want to say one other thing. Just one last thing. My students yes. at the university okay. tell me so many opportunities to go into the field. What was I thinking? I'm a little bit crazy to take them to Guinea, Senegal, Trinidad. Although I didn't take them to Trinidad during carnival because I could not be responsible for what <laughs> happened. But yes, it was so beautiful to see their eyes open and the, hear their stories and enjoy their epiphanies. Yes, thank you. We can take that uh, and more conversations in the breakout rooms afterwards, but I think um, before I open up uh, for a couple of questions, before we go into the breakout rooms, I'd like to briefly share my, sh my scenario um, in the UK. Uh, over the past couple of years in reference to documenting black arts, and my story focuses on a mapping research that we did. Um, it's a research survey that I led on for Dance of the African Diaspora at One Dance UK, one of my many hats on. So I was the director of the Association of Dance of the African Diaspora when we entered a merger with three other organizations to form what we now call One Dance UK in April, 2016. So I took on the role of head of dance of the African diaspora at One Dance UK and soon realized that the first major thing we have to do was to do a mapping exercise of the sector, which we started in the autumn of 2017. So the methodology we used was we conducted a survey to better understand the current sector practice and the key issues affecting professionals working within the DAD, dance of the African diaspora sector to ensure that our programs and the new way of working was still fit for purpose and meeting the changing needs. We wanted to know where dad was happening, what it looked like and what the priority needs were for the sector growth. And actually that resonates with some of these, uh, the information that we've been sharing from the panelists and where this black arts is found or embodied or wherever. So in the summer of 2018, we used findings from the initial survey to host face-to-face -face research focus groups nationally. And we held one-to-one -one sessions connecting on the ground with key independent artists 
um, as well as organiz organizational leaders, venue producers, programmers, and funders. And we put together further demographics of who was working, how they were working, and what they were working as, looking at things like the male to female ratio, disability, age, length of careers, and so on. And we made sure that we share findings with the wider sector along the way. So we used simple info, infographics and narratives spread in our magazines. Um, we have a magazine called Hot Foot Online, which is a voice for dance of the African diaspora perspectives. And one, which is a printed magazine for all of One Dance UK members. And in November, we launched the report for the mapping research and shared the findings and emerging themes with the delegates that came to the Regenerations International Conference. Actually, Kevin and Charles attended and were among the delegation that joined us in a World Cafe style roundtable to discuss the emerging themes and come up with some practical outcomes to help us shape the goals and action points to take forward. So I won't take up a lot of time to elaborate the findings, but you can find these on the links in the chat room. I did provide a, a, a link to the mapping report, which you will find. And um, I think it's just, just a scenario of one of the things that we kind of have to start doing because it's not enough and we need it. We really need it to kind of make a case and have that evidence that's so required for funding. Um, so we decided to highlight six themes of, you know, for six goals to commit on in an action plan. And these were around visibility and platforms, sustainability, that is funding and funding resource, audience engagement, legacy and archives, education and training, and lastly, something around networks and the knowledge gap and sharing. And we have shared all of this in an action plan framework. And we also sent out a call to action um, for the sector to be part of the making this sector a change, because I think it's really important for us to involve everybody in this whole thing. And this has been resonating from every speaker and on the previous panel as well. We have to do it ourselves as well. So <laughs> when COVID, the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement hit, it exacerbated the situation. So leading us in a triple crisis, health, race relations and the economy. So we're all here now. And what we're doing is now we're revisiting some of the action plans as a result, and we are reimagining strategies as is the rest of the world. And uh, one of the immediate things we did was to hold Zoom meetings with the sector, which I think Sapama is doing as well to pinpoint the real impact. We included these findings in a letter to the government and the councils and funding bodies to consider ways in which they could help the sector back to recovery. And if you have any question or if you haven't answered any of any questions that uh, well you want to do, don't worry, we'll come back to these uh, or in the breakout rooms. And so I just wanted to kind of share that with you before we break out, you know, something to think about, something as a scenario. You may have already done those um, mapping exercises as well. So I think it's important that we share these things. So um, I will open up before we do the go into the breakout rooms. I have a couple of um, actually a couple of uh, provocations that I think we could talk about, but I will open up the space at the moment and spend around five, six, eight minutes to talk about, yeah, to discuss amongst each other. The questions that I've prepared is in what way can black arts practices be differently documented researched and preserved for future artists and creators? And how can we actively document our work as black artists? And then the second question is starting today, as an artist, programmer, presenter, activist, arts enthusiast, researcher or educator, or all of the above, what do you see your role as in this responsibility? What do you see your role is in this responsibility? So we need to think about that. We can start talking about them and then go right into the breakout rooms as well. Because this is, this is just a starting point and we can discuss what else we can take into the breakout rooms right now. Okay, the flow is open. 
one way that I um I've heard people talk about documenting in like these like modern 21st century way is um, oftentimes we'll take photos of things um, like social media is kind of like where everyone is like uploading tons of content and it's almost as if it wasn't uploaded it didn't happen kind of thing and so uh, little things that we might consider insignificant just the process of uploading these sharing them online um, sharing them in community papers um, generating uh, content whether it be blogs um, it creates a digital archive which um, you may not have the intention of specifically mapping or archiving um, but someone may reference this like 10 20 years ago and we'll google um, an artist's name and we'll maybe google an event or an area and being able able to see this body of you know photos uh writing uh video even like a quick little video that you shot on your cell phone um sharing this online with, allows for community members to kind of be able to see what's happening but then also it, again is a digital archive which you know I've, I've you know heard a few people talk about the necessity for our community to share these things that are happening um because other communities do this very well you know they'll uh document online the things that happen uh that are intra-community but um yeah that digital archive is something that i've been grappling with yeah that's one really when you think about um things that are happening that social media has become the norm um also we're on zoom right now so there's so much being documented. So we have to own this documentation. Otherwise, um, it's just going to be lost in the ether. Yeah. I've also spoken with an, an elder who said that, yes, it is important to document it digitally. It's also important to keep the actual documents to find places for them. So be they people were talking about families having the archives and passing them down, be they our cultural institutions, be they libraries, be they universities, so that yes. there's also that tangible evidence. Yep, that's good. Um, I've got somebody else as well. I think the link is in the chat now. Uh, Michelle, action plans, developing audiences, pulling them in over years now in YYC Calgary, Alberta, Canada has been transformative. The community civic and provincial is supportive, so appreciative. So yeah, so I think we're uh, over to you, Kevin, I think. Thank you so much, Mercy, and thank you everyone for your amazing contributions on documenting and mapping. And we see that actually our practices are connected beyond the Atlantic Ocean and beyond into many spaces that we're coming from and have come from and migrated from as part of documenting. I also want to throw out there the idea of documenting as actually oral traditions. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we have to also make sure that we're recording those traditions and the ways in which we're also engaging with elders in our community because stories in my research has been an interesting thing to hear that we all capture stories differently. We all also honor stories differently. And then that becomes a rich potential for, again, uh, the theater of the streets, like Pauline has mentioned, the documenting that, that Mercy's doing and the research that Michelle and Emily is doing. We're gonna break into